let's rock and roll. Um, um, this will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood Community Service District Park and Recreation Commission. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on this agenda. At points in the meeting when the meeting chair requests public comment, members of the public participating in the live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. All public comments shall be addressed to the commission and limited to three minutes per speaker. The commission may choose to respond to comments or request staff to respond at the conclusion of the respective public comment period. Okay, I call the meeting to order. Item number one is our agenda. Commissioners, do I hear any edits or revisions? Hearing none, we will adopt our agenda as presented. Uh, item number two, I'm asking for public comment on non-agenda items. Yeah, one second, please. Let me, uh, oh, Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, commissioners. Um, so, uh, what is the purpose of open space? Is it to recreate? Is it to preserve? Who is it for? Is it for just us? Is it for all, the uh, entire community? I think these are questions we should have very concrete uh, answers uh, uh, about and uh, because it determines how we manage our resource. Um, I grew up uh, <clears throat> next to a, uh, in Massachusetts, uh, next to a, a big park, and uh, I spent my youth playing around, riding my bike, uh, swinging on swings, building forts, underground uh, forts, you know, meeting with my friends. When I got a little older, we smoked cigarettes. We did, got into na uh, naughty things. Um, but as a result of growing up uh, in the park, I, I developed a lifelong passion for the outdoors. Um, and um, I, I chose to uh, move to Marinwood years ago because of this open space. I wanted my kids to have the same experience I had, uh, something they never experienced in Los Angeles. Um, so uh, recently I, uh, there was a report, uh, there's a report in tonight's uh, meeting that you're, you're, you've taken down some uh, bike ramps and uh, on next door people are talking about uh, swings being removed and I just think we really need to uh, think about this policy. I know the answer, the answer from the CSD it's for safety reasons but I don't think that really holds up to reality because we have a lot of unsafe things that we do and kids need this open space. They need to recreate. You know, the best playground in my lifetime has been open space. And uh, our kids have been locked away for the last couple of years. So I would like to see the board um, adopt a policy of kind of hands off uh, uh, with these kids' structures and kids' playthings. It's uh, the right thing to do. And if we want, uh, if we're concerned about safety, then we need to fix the ramp uh, and on quiet wood uh, that is uh, hazardous to senior citizens. Look at drinking in the park. Get a, get uh, 
adequate bathroom facilities so we don't have raw waste in our um, in our woods and just you know think a little bigger about uh, this incredible resource that we have around us thank you okay moving on we'll move to item number three this is the draft minutes of our September 27th, 2022 PNR Commission meeting. Uh, we are looking to approve uh, the minutes. Uh, comments from commissioners? No, nothing to change. In, in that case, uh, I would ask for a motion to approve the draft minutes as presented. So I have a motion from Commissioner Fine. Second. And uh, second from Commissioner Banish. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. None. Uh, uh, item number three uh, is approved unanimously. Uh, then move on to item number four. This is the draft minutes of the November uh, 8, 2022. This is for our. Uh, yep. uh, yes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I'll back up and ask for a public comment on the commission meeting. Yeah, one second. Yeah. Oh, just just a quick comment. Thank you very much for. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming back to me. Yeah, just a quick comment that. Um, uh, I know you guys decided that you want to meet every other month. I think it's very unfortunate. We've got a couple commissioners meeting uh, are missing uh, this this month, and you know, before you know it, we're not going to have much of a commission, and the input is going to be far less uh, from the commissioners. Um, I do think that you have, in my opinion, the most important job on the CSD. Um, and I would just much rather you be uh, more deeply engaged with uh, uh, policy uh, for our parks and open space. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will now move on to item number four, the draft minutes of the November 8th, 2022 board meeting. Again, this is uh, for our review. Any comments from commissioners? I get nothing. I, I, I have something I'd like to say then. Um, I just wanted to say that after reviewing the last board meeting, that it is truly unfortunate that a member of the public feels that being constantly demeaning and critical of everyone is the best way to get things done. I would like to take this opportunity to add my support to the board of directors view that Eric is doing a good job. Um, and now I would ask for public comment on the uh, draft minutes for the board meeting. Well, board members, since that, uh, John, uh, that was directed towards me, I'm going to uh, direct my comments back uh, to what you said. Um, and I think there's a misinterpretation of criticism of performance versus a personal attack. It was very disappointing in the board meeting that uh, the board members uh, uh, characterized my comments, and I think the comments precipitating it was something about the delay in the construction of, uh, of the, uh, 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 the sh maintenance shed. And I felt like uh, uh, a better uh, uh, technical oversight could have could be happening and that was characterized as a personal attack now i don't know about you but when a professional doesn't perform a task up to standards 
I feel that not only is it my right, it's the duty of everyone to point that out. You're in a position of oversight, not to, you know, bring the pom-poms out, thanks for doing your job this month and, and uh, you know, mowing the grass. Your duty is to see that things are done well, that our resources are being uh, used wisely, and that the policies that you adopt are being fulfilled. So, um, anyhow, you know, uh, I know some of you are professionals uh, in government, and maybe it doesn't work like private business, but in private business, I can assure you, standards have to be met. And standards, uh, you know, a review of, of actual, um, uh, you know, the actual work done gets done constantly. Otherwise, you go out of business. I have nothing more to say. I think, uh, I think you can, um, you know, take with it what you, you, what you can. And um, uh, I, I would also ask you to look at other communities and see how they are managed as a uh, comparative standard. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number five. This is the Miller Creek trail initiative update. Uh, I will have, uh, you have this information in your packet, but I'd like Eric, if you'd like to add anything or open up anything on this discussion. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, uh, again, this is 95% exactly what was included in the board packet. So you're already kind of familiar with what this document is. Um, and it was uh, when it went on to the board, I made sure to go out of my way to make sure that the PNR Commission was aware of this as well. Uh, the only real update here on this is, you know, in some levels of conversation and communication with the developers, uh, you know, they are amenable to uh, moving that date from 7:31 to 12, 7:31:24 to 12:31:23. Um, I don't have any of this kind of, you know, drawn up in writing or hasn't changed the agreements, but uh, just some kind of communication between us. They are amenable to it. Um, there are, uh, you know, some other kind of factors at play here, too, but that's the main one at this thing. And uh, there is no other changes to the terms or anything like that. The only change to any of the terms was just that date change. Uh, so this is just me kind of bringing this back to the commission and kind of include you guys uh, things kind of move fast and sometimes when things are ready to be on my plate it's uh, timing doesn't always allow it to go through the commission or talk even bring it to the commission before it's time to bring it to the board um, so that was why it was on the board uh, because of how it developed in a timing standpoint um, but this is where we are right now so i'm just bringing it back and if the commission had any other thoughts or questions or anything on this project or initiative i have a couple things you could clarify for me on the uh discussion about the proposed grading of district property as opposed to building a retaining wall yes thank you you know is that the cost difference in in one or the other and what the staff preference is at that site and also i imagine if there is regrading that would then be replanted right so as, this as is part of it uh, yep 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 this is actually to so these are two discussions that have been happening for a while, obviously, uh, trying to keep them compartmentalized because they're not actually, other than it involving the same two parties, they're two entirely different uh, topics. So right. uh, uh, they would have two entirely different legal agreements that were to go with them. Um, so in the grading aspect, and I forgot that I put this in here, so thank you. Um, Essentially, where the roadway is going to be cutting through the hillside, this proposed roadway that's going to lead to this facility cuts through the hillside. And their original plans call for a very steep and direct cut going through that hillside and then supported by, you know, eight, eight feet tall concrete retaining walls then to hold up the hillside. Um, but one of their civil engineers actually came to them with a, uh, with a, a different idea 
that was rather than making such a steep and drastic cut into the hillside and then supporting them by retaining, you could actually grade this. And they said, well, unfortunately, our property ends right here. And they said, well, would the other property owner be willing to talk to you about this? So they kind of came to us a long time ago with this. Um, and in looking at it, um, it would actually be easier on the natural environment than creating a steep cut into the hillside than supported. And then, yes, and, and all of that is kind of what's written into this agreement, John. So uh, revegetating the, you know, where the grading work would be to happen. Um, they would be responsible in, in perpetuity for any impacts um, down the line that might come from this, any drainage impacts. Um, it does have a drainage plan attached with it as well um, for a bit of a catchment system, uh, you know, kind of like the popular concrete V ditches that roll everywhere that you see so they would be entirely responsible for that for relandscaping for doing everything they actually recently sent me um, some draft uh, construction plans on this um, uh, we had them reviewed by a trusted uh, independent uh, consultant on our end who had some valuable feedback nothing major just some important points and questions to make so we sent them back and said you know these you need to address these five things uh you know please provide comment on this so i haven't gotten any uh i haven't gotten any response or feedback i don't expect to until happens for the holiday now at this point obviously um but all in all i actually think it's more of a win-win for everybody a they would be responsible for any impact that you know in the area where they work responsible to maintain it all into perpetuity uh and it would be less of a drastic effect as you're looking up into the hillside rather than staring at you know eight feet tall uh concrete retaining wall walls that run for hundreds of linear feet long down the roadway, it would be much more of a of less of an impact and a gradual uh, grading going up uh, sloped in with the hillside at no more than two or three to one. It seems like that would be much less costly to the developer than constructing the retaining walls. And to, to some those. degree, yes. Um, there's certainly a cost involved for them, no matter which way that they go with it, uh, this actually increases some of their um, drainage needs, um, you know, and water diversion needs to uh, just on the way that they would be looking at doing it and kind of now incorporating these V-ditch uh, series to go through there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, supply alone, they would be saving a lot on the on the other part too. And they're, that, that part is not lost on us. Um, anything else from other commissioners? Hearing none, I would ask for any public comment. Uh, yeah, one second. Um, I, I, it's unclear to me wh where this is located. Uh, maybe you can uh, let me know at, uh, uh, at the conclusion of my comments. Hey, this is the best news ever that I heard that they want they they want us to help them. Uh, uh, avoid building a eight foot uh, retaining wall. That looks like to me a huge negotiation chip and may in fact completely justify a hundred percent of the cost of uh, the trail. So I would not, you know, give in to them an inch until we have the inks dry on the trail. Um, uh, negotiation. So um, I, I'm guessing that I, I, I have no idea what the construction cost of eight foot retaining wall are, but I'm sure it's it's quite a heavy expense. So don't give it away. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving right along to are you going to tell me where it is? This is the consideration for placement of tables or benches in the open spaces area. Um, I think I will defer to Commissioner Pye to open this discussion. Yeah. Can we just quickly, though, going back, um, I think Stephen asked for just a description of where the road is. I have uh, my understanding. Is, this but... road is the proposed road that they're going to be building coming off of uh, an extension of Mar Mar Marinwood Avenue, kind of uh, roughly in the area behind um, or just west of like where the truck scales are on 101, where they're actually looking to be building this facility. Yeah. 
Cool. All right. So, um, so we had a discussion of, about the potential benches or tables at our last um, commission meeting, and um, Director Case and I chatted a little offline, and I think we both have a, a similar um, thought slash recommendation, which is to try um, at least like a, as a pilot, um, putting at least one bench, maybe one or two. I think Chris would like to maybe also try a table as a comparison as well um, up in the open space. I think um, he and I have communicated and I've gone up Queenstown a few times just to kind of scope it out. And I think my my recommendation would be that we try a pi the pilot up there, uh, up high on Queenstown where there's some very beautiful views. There's, I think, at least a couple spots that seem um, pretty uh, amenable to a bench and or a table. Um, it's high enough up there that I really don't think it's going to become any sort of attractive nuisance or anything. I think it, I think that if we do this, it will be successful and we will get a lot of positive feedback from the community. Um, um, I can try to share my screen. Is that, yep. do you think I can do that? How do, okay, there we go. I see share screen. Okay, let's try this. All right, I'll show you kind of roughly where we're thinking. All right, um, okay, I'm sharing. So let me maximize this. So first, here is, here's our map. Um, and so here's Miller Creek Road. I can just scroll down a little bit. All right, so here's the community center, et cetera. Um, here's Miller Creek Road, here's Queenstone. Um, so you climb all the way up Queenstone. Um, there's this big, this is kind of a very recognizable uh, turn right here. You're pretty high up. You're, I think that topo says 800, so you're over 800 by the time you're here. There's a, um, there's a pine tree right here on this little bluff that you can actually see from the 101. Um, it's kind of recognizable if you start paying attention to it. But so right after this, it's right, right around, I would say basically between here and then this is the Blackstone Canyon Trail, otherwise known as the Horn Trail, and it connects to Queenstone right here. So my recommendation for a pilot would basically be between here and here. Um, obviously, some of it goes out of our land right here, so we couldn't do it there. But basically, you know, in this stretch is, I think, the, um, the general area where Chris and I have been talking about it. Um, I can toggle over to this map, which um, Eric had shared with us. This is the um, Marin Maps website. Um, and I don't know that it has the property line perfect here because it look, doesn't match up with our map perfectly. Um, but here's that same turn where the pine tree is sort of right here. There's a spot right here. You can kind of see it. It says 980. There's kind of like a little rise right here. This to me is like, I think like maybe I've gone up it two or three times in the last few weeks to scope it out. This strikes me as kind of a perfect one. And I think even on our map, it's shown as our property. But the connection with the Horn Trail is up here somewhere. I think it's, yeah, yeah, right here. This is this kind of, this other rise. So this is sort of the connection with the Horn Trail right around here. And that would also be a nice spot. Um, as would potentially other spots in this stretch. But that's, so anyway, so going back to this, this is kind of between here and here. My proposal would be we figure out what people are comfortable with in terms of a pilot, whether it's one bench, two benches, or a bench and a, tr a, a table. Um, and if there's consensus that that's okay, then Chris and I could take a trip up there with Luke and someone else or something just to kind of scope it out and get a sense of like feasibility and get them to kind of ground truth that um, that it that it looks um, doable. Um, why don't I kick it over to Chris now? Um, to let him speak, especially since he wasn't able to be here for the other um, the other meeting. And then let me try to stop share so we can see each other. All right, Chris. Uh, you know, 
what, Ian? I don't really have much to say. I thought you presented that exactly the way uh, I would have. Um, I think there's this really beautiful stretch that has a number of, of stops along the way that, you know, it, it's sort of that vista point kind of concept where if we gave people um, a place to sit, um, and like, like Ian said, I'm in favor of this is a pilot, so why don't we, you know, try, try a, a bench and a table just to see. I think the table concern is that that's going to attract trash like people eating lunches. We're so high up. The first place Ian is talking about, um, you know, I think at a, at, you know, a, a normal adult pace, you're, you're talking about 25 or 30 minutes up this trail. Um, I'm pretty familiar with teenagers at this point, having one of them in my house and two of them just recently, they're not going to hike a half an hour up this mountain to, uh, to go party. That's not, I don't think that's an issue. Um, and if they are, they're going to do it whether there's a table there or not. Um, so I just think there's some beautiful spots along the way. Um, my buddies and I happen to frequent this quite a bit. Um, and I think it would be a total plus to actually put some seating and or a table up there to even further enjoy uh, what our open space has to offer right now. And I'm going to say one more thing, which was I, my phone camera doesn't work very well in, anymore, unfortunately, so I couldn't take a picture. But like for folks that haven't been up there, some of these vistas we're talking about are like particularly the, the one that was closer to the pine tree that I highlighted. It's like a 270 degree view where you get the whole San Pablo Bay, the East Bay and Mount Diablo and all of that, all of Marinwood into, you know, part, further parts of Marin. You see the San Francisco skyline, you have all of Mount Tam, and then you can even look kind of west a bit, like down towards Nicasio and out that way. It's like a, a world-class 270 degree view that sort of highlights the beauty of our community and why a lot of people have chosen to live here. So I, I think that the public feedback from doing this would be basically unanimously positive. Um, and I like Chris's idea of trying a table and trying a bench and sort of seeing how it goes. And maybe with the pilot, we don't do the heaviest, you know, we do it, we do ones that we can take out later if it doesn't work or whatever. Um, but anyway, why don't I stop talking and let other people chime in. Michael, any comments or ideas on this? Yeah, um, I'm definitely supportive of the idea of at least putting in benches. Um, I guess I was wondering, you know, what the, the added benefit of going with a table would be. I know there were some like more concerns that I would encourage like picnics or something, but um, yeah, I guess like, do you envision people like bringing up lunches and like, I feel, I just don't really know like what the extra benefit of a table would be. Like, you know, the table is for like cooking or playing games or um, putting out a spread. And I just, I'm not sure whether, yeah, whether it, there's the need for that, that, that high up on the mountain. Um, but yeah, so I just want to get more thoughts on that. Since I'm kind of the one uh, bringing that up, I'll answer if you don't mind, Ian. Uh, Michael, I think that's a really valid question. Um, I guess the way I see it is, you know, there are a lot of, like like me, my old buddies and I up there hiking. I see a lot of families up there, and there's a lot of people who are mountain biking and things like that up past what, where these potentially could be. And I do see it as a place where I'm bringing my sandwich, I'm bringing a bag of chips, I'm bringing a cold drink, and while, yes, I could eat that on a bench, then I'm kind of putting it on the bench next to me and juggling it and it can get a little breezy up there to have something in front of me, like where I can put it out and eat more normally, I think is, is an added bonus. Um, you know, and I, I just see it like, yeah, nobody's going to like bring a game or anything up there. I can't imagine, but I just see it as being a place where you could more comfortably eat and enjoy the, the company of your friends while you're looking at, to use Ian's words, it's literally a world-class view. You know, um, I mean, these are the types of pictures if you were going to uh, Airbnb your house, you would say, minutes from this view, um, and you would kill it. Okay. I guess I, I trying to look at it from other perspectives, I, 
one of my questions was, you know, what percent of the community would benefit from uh, benches or tables up there? But from hearing what you guys are saying, there's a fair amount of people that get up on that hill. And so I, I, I could, I think that, you know, can be justified. Um, another concern I would have is to me, open space is an, a natural undeveloped area. I think that's an important, an important concept in open space. The idea of developing bicycle jumps in open space so kids can do their thing, you know, I, I, I don't agree with that at all. You know, I, I think it's important to, main, to maintain open space as, as an undeveloped natural area. I don't see where putting a bench or a table is that much of an impact to that area as a bicycle jump or something like that would be. So I, you know, still think that you know, that's an important consideration. And then the last thing is just, you know, additional tasks to an already overloaded staff is always a concern. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there is a way to move forward with this without, you know, putting too heavy of a footprint on the open space, so to speak. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, just trying to get some clarification, and obviously uh, I want to make sure if Luke has any thoughts on this, that he gets more than an opportunity to speak. Uh, my main question, I think, is, you know, when you say a table, like what kind of table are you envisioning? It's like your standard picnic table like we have in the park kind of a thing, uh, two attached wooden benches on both sides, uh, you know, rectangular kind of table setting. I mean, is that what you're thinking? That's the way I see it. Yeah, and then my my second question would be, you know, and, and I don't know this answer, um, and I would probably defer to some of our park guys on this, but being able to secure it in place, um, my experience is, you know, tables and benches get moved if they're not secured in, in place, so it's a matter of, you know, what is that? Do we need to bring up 100 pounds of, you know, 50 pounds of concrete and... Uh, and do that so we can chain it to that? Is this something that it gets chained to this pine tree that you're talking about? Uh, even though it's way out there, uh, things get moved. Yeah, it's just the end of the story. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't shock me, I suppose, if one day you're going up there and this uh, table is sitting in the middle of the road uh, or somewhere, you know, just in a different place or somebody has decided it would be fun to roll it down the hill. So it would need, you know, wherever you want to place this, it would need some way of securing it in place, but that doesn't, you know, I guess kind of permanently scar the natural environment too. So, I mean, even if you're just kind of digging a hole and using a, uh, you know, a little bag of quick read or something, uh, which again, you know, sounds easy enough, but you got to make sure you get the water up there. You know, you got to get everything you need up there to be able to make that happen and then be able to chain secure it to that place. Uh, and then assuming all of that, at the end of the day, you know, that can be dug out and removed and the hole filled and no harm, no foul. Um, so it would, you know, you'd never even know that that occurred. But that, you know, those are the two thoughts. One was just trying to wrap my head around what kind of bench you, you're envisioning or table or, or bench you're envisioning and then how it would be secured to the area so that in the, you know, for two things and then whatever that secured part is, can that also be just as easily removed? So it can be completely returned back to a 100% natural environment um, should that decision be made down the line. Uh, those are my Yeah, I, I think that the fact of securing it is, is important. And you know, on my screen, I can see a couple of volunteers that would go up there and dig that hole and <laughs> pour, some, pour some concrete. Uh, um, I, like for, for me, I, I totally agree with the securing it piece. Uh, um, I, I know Ian is a, is a hiker, and I'm sure others of you guys are potentially as well. Um, this is done in a lot of different, you know, park-like open space settings. Um, and I agree with you. I think you have to make sure that it's secure. The most common securing that I've seen is, like, as you're suggesting, pouring some sort of a concrete form, not the size of the table, but underneath the two, um, you know, whether it's a table or benches underneath, you know, some the piece that kind of secures the uh, legs to the table um, and then doing a chain or I've seen rebar kind of worked around it in a, in a very unobscure way. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, 
I envision tables like we have in the um, in the fireman's picnic area. Nothing, nothing more than that, right? And then just securing them in a way that, as you suggested, the park staff sees fit. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of recurring park staff kind of, um, I guess, additional labor, I think it's quite literally the labor of just putting it up there and securing it. And while that that's not like five seconds, I get that. I don't see this as being an ongoing thing. This is not like I hiked out enough. I, I like the worst thing I see up there, to be honest, is dog waste bags that apparently somebody is saying to themselves, I'm going to come and get that later. Um, but that, that is not going to be impacted by this, nor do I think we would have to have a dog waste bag management system up there. Um, it's, I think it would be status quo beyond we're just adding something really nice for people to sit back, relax, and enjoy, as opposed to having to sit on the ground or just keep walking because there's nowhere to sit. Right, and so that I'm clear, too, my comments weren't made to, like, counter this as being a good idea. I'm no, 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 I know they're not. From, the, from the reality of the situation of, you know, what kind of table are we talking about? And if you're going to put something up there, it needs to be secured in place so it cannot be uh, easily moved without, you know, heavy equipment if needed. The one, the one uh, thing that I would just add to that conversation is, um, like, especially if we're thinking of it as a pilot, that um, we, you know, don't maybe pour the biggest footing ever or whatever, do all that. Like, um, if it turns out that the feedback is that the table is too obtrusive or what, you know, I, so that would be my only thought would be there's maybe a balance here in terms of like, uh, I don't disagree with the securing thing, especially if it's going to become permanent, but just trying to minimize our footprint for the, um, for the, for the pilot period. That's all. I agree with you hundred uh, percent, Ian, and I personally would defer to, you know, Luke and his team in terms of what would be the best way to kind of secure this down or even look to some other examples. Uh, and, you know, in my opinion, doing something is not in, obtrusive uh, to the natural environment as possible too. I, I don't think I was envisioning like a, a large footing or even quite same level of secure uh, uh, footings that they have in the fireman's picnic area. But, you know, I, I'm uh, just something that would keep it secured in place so that, it can, you know, it doesn't mean you can't move it a foot or two in one direction, you know, if you got a chain around it in the right areas, but, you know, it would take somebody some serious effort if they either wanted to go up there with bolt cutters or, uh, you know, uh, a small amount of cement could provide enough of the foundation that you could attach a, uh, a chain, you know, some level of secure device so that it couldn't be moved, um, rather than, you know, actually pouring it in and putting footings into the entire table itself. So that, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just spitballing out loud. I, again, I would, I would defer to other people on this. And I will eat my words later if it turns out that this, has, but like, I just don't, I don't think it, I, I am not, we should plan ahead and, you know, be worried or whatever, concerned about these kinds of things. But I just, I don't think anyone's going to be pushing this table down the hill or whatever, but I will eat my words if I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I, I'm happy to just speak to, to some of the points coming up just from the, from the staffing end. Um, I think, you know, regarding the pilot program aspect of, of a first trial, I think, yeah, we could definitely do a very minimal um, securing. I think a lot of people really want to remove a table from a secured area that they can definitely do it. And so I think, uh, um, a chain and, and it's, it's more of a visual and it's just like, Oh, this is not just an easy flip over. And I think that does enough of the trick. We could do a very minimal amount of, um, concrete and chain, um, which I think would probably serve the purpose. And if someone did uproot that at some point, we could always go back in and, and do something a little bit more robust down the line, um, to that point. But I think uh, installing the table is very doable if that's, uh, you know, a table or and or a bench. Um, both those things are, our crew have done uh, many, many times and, and getting the materials up to Queen Sun is, um, is is also doable. So it's something, something that we can do. And I, I think we would definitely depend on uh, relationships we have with people that hike or bike the trail regularly just to kind of keep us in the loop on, on the status because we, we don't currently have time in our schedule to be up there uh, super consistently to just keep tabs on on you know these items but um you know if we had someone just checking in with us every so often and, and letting us know we do get up there when we can but someone said hey you know somebody uh flipped the table over or there's a group there's graffiti or somebody you know kicked something in or you know we, that would give us a chance to go up there and, and check it out um, so 
you probably take advantage of some of those relationships that you have with uh, community members that are actively hiking that, that trail. Like um, if somebody but, carved Chris and Ian were here into the table, uh, somebody would report it to us? Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. As long as it has a heart around it, it should be okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so it's definitely it's very doable from, from the staffing end. It, this this is feasible. Uh, I think uh, to the point of how many of these um, eventually we're going to do. I think the more um, infrastructure you add, then then that it does increase the chances that there is something that's damaged or has been vandalized, and does increase the amount of times that staff are having to go up and, um, and deal with that. So um, you know, a bench, a table. I agree that I, I would not assume that there would be much of an issue with that from a maintenance perspective, but um, depending on where this where this goes, you know, that, that could change um, how many things we end up putting out there. All right, I think that uh, was a positive discussion. Anything else from commissioners? Then I would ask for public comment on this item. Yeah, one second, please. Steven. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Chris and Ian. This is a fantastic idea, and I'm so glad that you had the initiative to uh, get this done. I think the key thing is that this is a test. It's a test to see whether, you know, the public wants a, a bench up there, which I think we, most people would, would agree that it's a good idea, but also the location. Um, and um, because it's a test, I don't think that you need to fret too much about securing uh, it permanently. Um, one thought is uh, why not get a concrete bench? And, you know, concrete benches weigh like 300 pounds. And, uh, so if someone is motivated to uh, move a bench, they've got to be very motivated to, to push it down the hill. So I, I don't precisely know if it's appropriate for the location, but that's an option. Um, so uh, anyhow, thank you so much for, for doing it. Um, I think John Toon did bring up a point, who's going to be using it. Um, and, of course, it's going to be fit people who like to hike and bike up in that area, which is fantastic. But, you know, um, uh, that's only part of our population. And uh, uh, one of the things I have been asking for, and no one seems to be terribly interested in it, but if you ask seniors, they would really like a park bench in Marinwood Park so they can walk the the dog uh dog leg uh and have a place to sit and chat with their friends between um the picnic area and uh uh, uh miller creek road don't have to do a lot these benches don't cost a whole lot but i i do think uh that is worthwhile test as well just get one bench see if people like it and uh, you can pull it out if it, it doesn't work. But um, uh, please, I, I think uh, there's, you guys are kind of overlooking uh, the senior and uh, mobility uh, challenged people in our neighborhoods. And uh, we do need to serve all of the people in our district, not just a handful of uh, young young bucks who like to ride mountain bikes. Thank you. Oh, one other thing too, if you want to get some good examples um, of benches and also bike ramps, you could go up to Stafford Park and uh, receive some information, uh, uh, inspiration. They've, they've got some good stuff up there. Thanks. Uh, Eric, I have a question just so you could clarify for me. To, um, there are some new seating areas going in around or near the new maintenance facility. Yep, uh, actually right in front of the maintenance facility. Uh, you know, we've kind of constructed a whole new pathway and that'll meander through that area. There is two uh, circular bump outs uh, designed specifically for this purpose. And there'll be uh, actually an eight person um, 
you know, kind of round, not round, but you know, I think the hexagon or octagon or whatever it is, must be an octagon, uh, picnic benches that will be going right in that area. If you're familiar with the pool complex, they're the exact same tables that sit on top of the uh, hill above the pool uh, that we often rent out for picnics. Uh, so those will be getting placed in, that, in, in those areas right there. Okay, well, this was just a, an item for discussion tonight. We're not making any recommendations or anything on it. So I guess, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the next step for this is. No, I mean, this is helpful, you know, to be truthful. You know, things like deciding to place a picnic table or something somewhere is uh, helpful to get the feedback on, especially at a PNR commission level. I, you know, I don't think this is anything we need some level of like a uh, formal vote or anything. I think if you had you know, wildly split, you know, some commissioner saying I absolutely hate the idea and other commissioner saying, no, I love the idea, then maybe we'd take it to a vote. But this isn't the type of action that needs a level of formality. Um, you know, the staff can certainly act on this. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I can't remember if it was Chris or if it was um, Ian, but it would probably be helpful um, when they have time. And, you know, right now we're headed into big rainy, you know, I, I guess, and correct me what your timing thinking is, but I, I'm, I'm looking at this as more of like a spring project, um, uh, you know, in terms of placement, but it would be good um, just so we're all kind of clear, although Ian, I appreciate um, you kind of pointing out, out those areas on the map, but it might be, be a bad idea to take a field trip um, with Luke or myself or one of our park staff or something so that we're all kind of clear on where exactly it is that we're, we're looking at um, and thinking of, so um, you know, we can kind of coordinate schedules on on such a thing and if it's on a weekend i might be able to do it and if time is an issue uh you know we certainly have access to vehicles that can get up there as well so uh we uh, you know that 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 cuts the time needed down uh, by a minute or two uh, when you're uh, making your way up there on a in a vehicle let's jump in a fire truck <laughs> That might be a little egregious, but uh, we can uh, uh, we, we could possibly look at using the fire utility truck. Uh, or again, we have you know the UTV goes up there too. But uh, I've, uh, I'd be lying if I said I haven't driven the fire utility all the way up that road to the top too. So uh, that's always an option as long as it's available and not being needed at the time. And I just want to say one last thing, just to appreciate the conversation and everybody um, and Chris for kind of you know prodding us in the first place to talk about it. And in response to Stephen's point about uh, mobility, and uh, like, I, I think, um, you know, there's a trade off between the further up you get, the sort of smaller the percentage of the population that might be using it, but it also means there's probably less of a likelihood of vandalism and things like that. So I think it works well as a pilot. Like, let's put these up high, see how they go, see what kind of feedback we get. If it is positive and people seem to like it and there's not a lot of vandalism, then we can try to talk about introducing them in other more accessible places down down the road too or whatever. So I don't think this is, um, the, you know, hopefully if this is successful, we can revisit the idea of putting putting more in other places too. Well, I think as long as it doesn't have a sign attached to it that says biking prohibited off trail, it should, uh, it should survive. <laughs> All right, then we'll move on to uh, item number seven. This is the uh, timing. Con uh, I'm sorry, John. Yeah, yeah, you're good. We took public comment on it. I apologize. The timing considerations for the implementation of the Marinwood Play Park structure replacement project. I did. Uh, Just quickly, I'd start off and, and mention or ask if any of you had the opportunity to visit the playground at the new, I guess they're calling it the Tunnel Top park there in the Presidio and Chrissy Field. That's a, that's a that's a pretty amazing looking playground. So if, if you haven't had a chance to go to there, you should, it's definitely worth the trip. Is that the nice one that's day. like on top of a building or something like that? But it's over the old uh, Doyle Drive. It's the tunnels. Oh, right. Okay. So they, they completely, they, they've got grass and benches and just you know, a lot of different seating areas, and it's it just it's it's real nice up there, and it's it's accessible from right at the kind of the main parade ground of the old Sixth Army there in the in the Presidio. You just kind of there's a parking lot there, and you uh, can just walk across the street and walk into it. 
the playground is actually down at the level of Chrissy Field itself. So it's on the on the north at the bottom of the north slope there. But that's a that's a nice location. But as far as our own playground, <laughs> um, Luke which isn't going to be quite as expansive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, Luke, you were looking into, you know, considering the timing, which, you know, from a staff perspective, you know, what works best for you guys? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, when the construction would potentially happen, is that what you're asking, John? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's an, it's a good question. Uh, my feelings uh having gone through you know a handful of construction projects while while working here over the years um i know that things can get delayed and things always tend to take a lot longer than the original uh, assumptions or the original prediction so um i i would be wary of doing something that uh is gonna get all buttoned up right before summer um knowing that that probably means that we would have a construction project going um you know deep into our uh, summer camp program, which which would be um, uh, it, it would be rough to have the playground off limits while we're running one our you know, our biggest program of the year. So my feelings are that um, uh, we potentially would want to you know do something in the fall. But I don't know is that is that what you're getting at, John? Oh, yeah, he, he might have froze up on us there. Um, yeah. So um, as far as yeah, as far as the timing, I mean, I think that's that's just our, our our biggest program does take place in those three months of summer. So um, I would I would probably err on do something after that program ends, as opposed to do something that's 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 slated to end right before that program begins, if there was an option for that. Uh, yeah, I have some other thoughts too. John, you froze up on us for a second there. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's happened to me a couple, three times tonight, and I don't know quite what's going on, so uh, there are parts I just miss. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, Luke. Do you want to repeat that? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, no, John. I was just, I was just somebody. If we're picking a, a time of the year um, to to try to do this project, uh, I would prefer to do something that that starts close to the end of our right after our summer camp program as opposed to something that's going to start before that and be trying to end in time for the summer camp to start. Uh, um, that, that, that would be my uh, perspective as well and I, I know Ann was concerned about the impact of the, the timeline as far as how long a playground would be closed and, and I think that uh, you know like you say you start something in the spring and then you can't get it all done and then it just drags on and then there's just limited access here or limited access there so I yeah and, and to that, that point idea. to that point john I, I agree i think that uh the the fall and winter months um while maybe not the best for construction are uh, tend to be lower impact um for playground usage so spring and summer are are the big seasons for um people coming out to the park and using the playground um so i would take that into consideration as well I had a couple other thoughts on the time timing of it too, and just you know, looking at this of uh, completing it before summer camp or completing it after summer camp is you know when this does get completed, it's gonna be a draw, and a lot of people are going to want, in my opinion, to come and play at the you know with the new play structures and the new play equipment, and if that's happening shortly before summer, and then we launch into summer camp, uh, anybody who's driven by our Summer is a zoo here, and there's a lot of kids, and there's a lot of activity, and, uh, you know, if we're adding to that the draw of a brand new playground, that's going to be drawing even more people into the park. You know, the pool's busy, the park's busy, some of our groups are using the playground. Um, you know, there's a part of me that wonders if, you know, simply from that aspect, if waiting until after summer camp has ended, and then, you know, in the fall, you have, uh, you know, or late summer, early fall, summer camp ends, you know, mid-August, early early to mid-August, uh, just before school starts back up. And then, you know, August, September, uh, and maybe even, October, you know, depending on how long it takes for them to do this, you have a, uh, a, uh, a new playground going in. Uh, you know, that brings people back, that gives people reason to come and, and play, but you, they're not competing with, literally 400 to 500 kids that are also running around the park or 
the litany of people going to the pool or using kind of the picnic areas. I, I, and by the time next summer rolls around, the draw of a new playground isn't near, you know, anytime a new playground comes in or new equipment comes in, it brings a lot of people who are, you know, kind of park goers and go to a lot of playgrounds with their kids or nannies or anything. So I just, it can be pretty intimidating. Hey, they got new play stuff. Let's go there. And then it's just a completely, it's a zoo. Uh, it's an organized zoo, but it's, it's pretty, you know, 400 kids is 400 kids. There's no two ways you can get around that. And our kids are using the park and you got other kids using the park and, uh, so, you know, that to me, I thought, I felt like was a little bit of a consideration factor to take into mind and to think about, if nothing else, that, you know, you, if we finish something up, you know, with timing wise, there's no way it's not going to be done, um, you know, late spring, early summer, looking right before, you know, kind of camp gets started, you know, to Luke's perspective. And do we want to be introducing a brand new playground at the exact same time as we're running our 400 kids? Camp too. I don't know. I think it's something worth thinking about and uh, and discussing. Maybe I'm overplaying it. Maybe I'm uh, thinking too much about it. I don't know. But uh, that was certainly a thought that we had had here and a thought that I had had expressed to me by other people too, um, just when it kind of came to timing. And then Luke, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember if you touched on it. I know Luke was able to get a hold of a couple of people just talking about lead times needed from the point of contract award. Um, and they varied widely um, I don't have that information immediately in front of me but if you just wanted to kind of just some of the ballpark numbers on what some of the lead time was from the point we award a contract yeah I'm not happy to I, so I, I put some calls out to some uh, vendors local um, playground vendors that we would probably be sending our you know request for proposals to um, once this project's ready to, to go out there to bid and I'm just asked about how long it's taking when they get a new order in for a new playground or a new playground structure, um, how long they're waiting for those parts to get manufactured and delivered, um, just so we can kind of know what that what we're looking at for that timeline. And I was surprised uh, that I got such different answers from some of the different companies I talked to, all based in California. And uh, one was, oh, you know, one to two months. One was, um, you know, 34 weeks. Uh, another was um, about 12 weeks, so it was kind of like all all over the map, depending on where they're getting uh, the parts. And, and this did, I think, depend on what state the, the manufacturers are based out of. So it, it sounds like there's a lot of variability um, to this project in terms of you know how long it's going to take for parts to arrive, and that's very heavily dependent on supply chain. And so um, it sounds like certain manufacturers are, are uh, able to to get things to their customers um, much more quickly than, than others. And that may be something we, we look at when going into this, depending on how, how important the timeline is for this project. But uh, um, yeah, the, the, the longest one was 34 weeks was the, was the average um, for receiving new parts. And I thought that was, um, that was a kind of, a, that surprised me at how, how long that was. Um, but, uh, but that was a, that was a major playground um, construction you know, company. And then just to be clear, I mean, I'm still kind of envisioning a, uh, you know, kind of a late winter, early spring, hopeful um, being able to get an RFP out there. And then the RFP would dictate the dates of, you know, a uh, playground to be constructed, even if we're saying, you know, September or what, you know, something along those lines. Um, it doesn't stop you from awarding this that much earlier. And, you know, according to the research that Luke has, it also doesn't... Uh, preclude some of these ones that need this longer lead time. So we might really like a company that says, yeah, but we can't get the materials there for a, an extended period of time. Well, you've built in that extended period of time, but I don't think it precludes the company that says, well, we want to do it now. It's no, we'll award you the contract in the spring, but actual installation isn't going to happen until uh, after summer. Um, or after our summer camp programs end, and that's a much better time to be closing down the playground. And, and like I said, I think it creates a new draw once it's completed without people, you know, coming to this new draw to what is going to be a very, very, very crowded park environment. So I don't know. Be curious for any thoughts on, on any of what Luke and I uh, shared, more so on Luke's side. Commissioners?
Yeah, it sounds like aiming for fall construction seems like the, the move. So I agree. Yeah, I think you guys have got a good handle on what, what you know what's going to happen there, and so I'm sure you'll make the the right move. It's you know seems to work the best. Chris, you have any thoughts? Uh, I know your family's been uh, heavily supportive of this project uh, and are very much looking forward to it happening too. So I, I, I I'm happy to talk to you offline as well. I've uh, you know, I, I think when we got into this, we weren't thinking, okay, this is still another year away or this or that. But, uh, you know, when you start to look at all of how all of the dominoes fall when you are trying to put together something like this and thinking it, everything through, I don't know why I just went so dark on you guys. Uh, but uh, it's the black. It seems that way. Uh, you know, there, there are other consideration factors that, you know, take into place, too. So I'm not sure what thoughts are, you might have on any of I, I, I don't, I, I think we... We do it right, um, and, and that means taking the time to, to find the right company, to find the right items that we want, all of that. I don't, our, I've got nothing in terms of any any personal piece that would like preclude that. No way. Right, or, or expectations of this being done yeah. sooner than that. No, anyway. zero expectations. We're just happy to support this project. When it happens, um, it's going to be awesome. No worries from us. Anything else from commissioners? And I would open it to a public comment. Sure, one second. Uh, fantastic. I love the idea of this, this project mo moving forward. And uh, John uh, Toon's suggestion to look at that park um, uh, in the Presidio, I. I haven't been down there myself, but uh, people talk about it. And I believe the reason they people talk about it is not simply because it has slides and, uh, and swings and, and typical things you find in a park, but there's a design element that makes it unique and exciting. And uh, I just hope uh, when selecting vendors that you keep in mind that this is a landmark project, a design project. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously there's going to be constraints um, for cost, but uh, let's try to make this uh, something that people go, oh, wow, did you see that park in Marinwood? They've got a cool park. I think that would be a, a great achievement. Um, anyhow, that's actually all I wanted to say. and and. Thanks again uh, for uh, the Case family's generosity and supporting this project. I know you guys are going to do a great job on this. Thanks. Excuse me. <coughs> okay, we'll move on to item number eight. This is the Recreation and Park Maintenance Activity Report. Mr. Fred, well, we have your report before us, but you may like to highlight some of the uh, items on it. Thanks, John. Yeah, I'll just highlight a couple things. Um, and uh, well, um, since we last met, we've had a couple events, our, namely our Halloween Harvest Festival and our Fall Art Show. Um, and I talked about this in our in our board meeting, uh, which, which maybe you guys have had a chance to, to check out. But um, uh, both events were went really well and had um, potentially record attendance and um, we're very excited to just kind of be be through the, the, the weird anomalies of COVID and, and it seems like things are squarely back into a traditional um, level of attendance and excitement for, for community events. And so we're very encouraged by the way those went and uh, especially moving into our, our winter event, our annual event, which um, uh, is our, we're calling it Jingle Bell Jazz. It's a, a Hot winter holiday concert that's taking place on December 9th. Um, this is the same event that we did last year, um, which we moved outdoors in an effort to be, um, you know, friendly and uh, and kind of appropriate for for people that weren't ready to be in a big uh, a, a big crowded indoor event while COVID was still with us. Um, and that was really fun and went really well. And so we're we're um, going to try to to do a repeat of that if weather will permit. And we're going to have a a good uh, jazz band playing holiday classics and favorites. We're going to have 
photos with Santa. We'll have um, uh, refreshments and and uh, some heat lamps. And it's gonna. I, last year was really fun. We're gonna try to do that again. So we do have a plan B. If if there's rain in the forecast, we'll we'll move things indoors. But otherwise, um, we are planning on doing a, a a really fun outdoor holiday concert event. So I um, hope you guys are able to make it out to that. That's the next big thing on our on our agenda, um, happening in a couple weeks on December 9th. Here, uh, it'll be on the patio just outside the reception hall. Um, and then our next big recreation uh, program is our winter break camp, which is taking place the week of December 19th uh, for the kids that are out of school for the for the holidays. And uh, the enrollment for that's um, you know it's already like filled up, and, and we're looking forward to having a bunch of our camp summer camp counselors back in town uh, for their holiday breaks, helping um, helping us run that camp. So uh, that'll be great. We are still recruiting for uh, our uh, vacant recreation supervisor position. Um, we've got uh, some applicants have come in and, and we're, we'll be conducting interviews um, early in December and we're hoping to uh, come out of that with a viable candidate to take that position. Um, we're looking forward to filling that spot. So we'll definitely keep everybody on the commission updated um, as we make progress in filling our, our vacancy there. Um, and then the last thing, and uh, this is a little bit overdue, but I, I included in my report uh, our summer financial uh, report spreadsheet that um, I report on every year when we finally get all the numbers reconciled. Um, and this is at the end of my report uh, showing um, our financials for our summer program, including all of the, the pool season, the aquatics programs, and our, um, our summer camp program. I've um, I thrown in here a few bullet points uh, just to, to talk about some, some items of interest. I'm not going to go through all of those. Um, I'd be happy to uh, answer specific questions about um, you know the, the numbers for this season. I'll just say that uh, I did a five year spread um, yeah, five year spread um, in order to just show kind of the normal trajectory we had before the pandemic, you know, 2018, 2019, things were normal going in a certain direction. And then um, 2020, 2021, we obviously had to scale our programs way back uh, due to the, the health guidelines. And we could only run very small camps. We um, had to do all of our pool programs had to be very restricted. It was like reservation only. Um, we, we could only let so many people into the facility at a time. And so uh, obviously our, our, you know, our revenue and expenditures were, were hugely affected by um, what we were allowed to do the last two years. And then 2022 um, was a big return to normal operations. So I wanted to give you guys like a bigger picture to show you kind of, um, you know, where we are, where we were this summer in comparison to kind of like the normal trajectory before COVID. And um, uh, staff's conclusion was that um, things have, have very much returned back to normal. I think uh, you know, there, there are lingering effects from the pandemic and we didn't see all of our normal pool members uh, return to the pool this year. I think people are still um, uh, playing it safe, staying away, especially some of our senior members. And um, But we did gain a lot of new uh, pool users, a lot of families that found us during the pandemic when almost nobody was open and, and we were we were offering some programs. We actually did gain a lot of new people that uh, discovered us, which is which is really cool. And they, they returned in 2022. And purchase memberships and, and that was um, really exciting. And our summer camps, uh, the demand was um, was definitely back to normal, if not uh, uh, higher than, than it ever has been. So um, that was very encouraging that uh, people uh, didn't didn't forget about us and um, our programs all um, uh, ran very well. Uh, we did make some changes to, to our scheduling and, and some of our, our programs, but um, overall uh, we were very uh, encouraged and, and happy with the way that the, the summer turned out. So um, you guys can, can check out that uh, report and I'd be happy to, to answer any questions about it. Um, it. And I guess I could do that now or I may, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go through my parks maintenance report and then at the end, if you guys have any questions about parks maintenance, recreation or um, the, the summer numbers, we can we can do all that at the end. I guess that, that probably makes the most sense. So um, I'll talk briefly about what the parks maintenance staff has been up to and then, and then we can get to that. Um, just uh, one thing, uh, a big uh, item of uh, big positive news is that uh, Estevan, one of our parks maintenance staff, um, has had a baby and uh, he was out for a little while um, dealing with that and, and we're really excited to have him back 
on staff, um, and his, uh, we're, we're excited to, to meet his, uh, his second son, Cameron, um, when, when we get a chance, hopefully soon. But um, we're happy to have our staff made whole again, and, and his family's doing well. Uh, the staff um, have been doing a lot of pool maintenance, just getting stuff ready for the next season while the weather is still good, um, being able to make some repairs and, and get things kind of refurbished before it gets too cold and wet uh, to, to be effective out there. We did our annual um, creek inspection as well as walking the open space and looking at all the drains and bee ditches and culverts to see if things were in uh, good shape to be able to handle the hopefully coming, uh, you know, uh, water coming through from the rains, and um, and overall things are are in good shape. And we've we've made a few, um, did a few cleanups and uh, had to address a few things in the creek, but overall everything is in good shape and, and we're we're ready for a wet winter if uh, the if the wet winter will will have us. So um, that that's uh, we're happy to see that, and um, and then we did mention there there were some. Uh, uh, a report. We got some reports of some bike jumps being constructed in the open space um, along um, just adjacent to Horn Trail and Blackstone Canyon, um, which uh, staff did go out and we, we did um, try to do our best to return that area to its natural state as best as we could. Um, it was pretty egregious. The, uh, the individuals that, that built the jumps did um, dig a lot out of the sides of the hills. Um, it, it does look like a big scar out, out there and definitely was a defacing of, of the open space in order to, to create a few, you know, bike ramps and jumps, which um, is unfortunate. And um, there is definitely still, you know, looks blighted, but, um, but staff are monitoring it and we did our best to, to kind of um, discourage further activity out there and we'll continue to monitor that um, as, uh, as the season goes on. Um, but that's, that's kind of uh, all I really wanted to touch on. I'm happy to answer any questions um, from my report um, or anything that I talked about or anything else that you guys um, have that you want to ask. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Luke. Uh, commissioners, any questions, comments? I have a couple of random things. Um, one, just about the pool. I noticed the Luke, the Terra Linda pool. Um, decided to try to stay open in November as a pilot program and apparently it was so successful that they're now going to stay open in just into December as well and um, I guess I would throw that into the ether as something for us to consider in the future or whether it is something we've considered and if there's a reason why we ruled it out but it might be worth a conversation with the Terra Linda folks or something to get a sense of um, I mean, may, maybe having both of them open would reduce demand at either one and make it not worth it. But it just um, just wanted to flag that 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 um, seemed like something maybe worth considering. Um, and then, yeah, I'll just leave it there. I, I'll leave it there for now. Um, yeah, I just uh, I, I um, will let you know, Ian. Thanks for that that comment. Um, we we are in contact with the Terra Linda Recreation or Santa Fe Rec Department. We're, they're good friends of ours and we do talk a lot and we, we um, have talked to them about their, their fall pool season. I don't have their final, you know, takeaway from that. Uh, and I know that um, I'm sure that that program was really popular, especially with the lap swimming community that's, that's always hoping to find a, a pool to swim year round. And we always get, get requests for that. Um, but I would be curious what, at the end of the day, you know, with, with their staffing and heating and chlorination costs, if, if, if that program was, um, you know, deemed, this, deemed successful or just popular and, and those would be two different things. But, uh, but yeah, it's something we evaluate every year um, and, and looking at the demand and looking at what, what it would take for us to be able to run um, the pool during the fall at, and, and not be at a loss every day. So um, that'll be something that we that we consider, but I, I appreciate the comment. Thanks for definitely looking into that. Yeah, maybe once their December wraps up, it'd be worth asking and taking a look at their numbers and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We, we definitely will. And then my other comment, I'll just throw, I'll just say that it was the, you know, with the, the bike jump stuff is, um, you know, I, I, uh, um, see it from both sides, and I think that, you know I've seen some of those jumps down there at Blackstone Canyon before, and they 
can be pretty egregious at times. And, and so I understand it all. I sometimes, you know, where we live, I, I will see high school students, you know, on their mountain bikes with a shovel on their shoulder and things like that. And I'm part of, I'm just, I'm a little torn about it because there are a lot of worse things that high school kids could be up to than spending time outdoors doing these kinds of things. And, you know, on the one hand, it is defacement of open space and all that stuff. But on the other hand, I don't know. It all, so the, so a thought I've had, and I, this is, would not be from Marinwood to take on, and I kind of wish John Campo was on, but maybe I'll just share the thought with him one, one time, would be like, almost like if the county or the bike coalition or some, somebody like offered like classes for uh, high school students or like about like best practices for bike, tra you know, like, um, or something like that. I just like, uh, part of me thinks that some of that there are worse things these kids could be doing and that like there, I wish there was a way to like harness that desire to do what they're doing in a way that's less damaging. Um, and that's probably more than Marin with CSD could take on or whatever. But uh, I just, just, just saying that I have observed this, um, you know, this back and forth with the kids in the, us coming and shutting them down a number of times now. And I guess I'll just say, I see it, I see it from both sides and I, I don't, I'm not saying that I think we're doing the wrong thing by taking it down when we see it. And I'm sure there's liability issues and all of that, but I just also like thinking of it from the high school age kids perspective. It's like, I just, I wish there was a way to, to, to provide them a different option or something like that, that, that would still allow them to do some of what they're doing, but in a less damaging way or something like that. Anyway, no one needs to respond to that. I just wanted to say it. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Well, Luke, uh, thanks for that um, spreadsheet. That really shows us. Uh, uh, you can go ahead. Sorry, no, I thought you were going to move on. I can talk after you. <laughs> I just wanted to state that the, the spreadsheet really paints a clear picture of kind of what you guys went through during the pandemic and and how, how things have turned around. So that's, you know, it's very clear black and white or in color there, I should say. That, that's all I had. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to similarly say, yeah, it's great to see that the, the summer net was, you know, the highest that it's been. In, in, in the past five years, um, even pre-COVID. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a sign of a healthy program. So that's great. Thank you. All right, if nothing else from the commission, then uh, again, we would open this item to public comment. One second. Uh, yes, uh, I really appreciate Ian's comments, and I'm really glad uh, uh, the perspective that he adds to the conversation. He sounds like he had a, a, a youth much like mine in the uh, open space. In fact, I, I recall him mentioning that he used to ride his bike in the open space. Um, Stafford Park does, it's, it's, they have a bike park up there. Now, I, I'm, I don't ride like that, but um, it might be an inspiration of what we could do. Um, in, you know, is there a spot, and I'm, I'm just throwing this out there, is there a spot there that we could tell the kids, go build your jumps here, don't build them, you know, in Blackstone Canyon or, or some someplace else? You know, we're about to spend a lot of money on... Um, a, uh, a playground uh, uh, for for young kids, and I do think that we miss out on the the middle school kids and the high school kids, and um, their recreation needs are just as great. And it, yeah, if we can keep them on their bikes and digging trails or doing good stuff in the outdoors, that's a heck of a lot better than you know. Um, abusing drugs and alcohol in our parks. So I, I, I think we should keep an open mind on this. Um, I do understand the liability issue, 
I think there's a heck of a lot more liability uh, with a uh, senior walking up a steep embankment to get out of the park or coming into the park than there is from kids um, uh, riding their bikes in the open space. But um, I, I, I think it's a matter of policy. But uh, the park is for everybody. And, and let's, let's think about this as a resource. I disagree that it's uh, uh, a sanctuary, a nature sanctuary. I think it's really a sanctuary plus a recreation um, uh, opportunity. And we should look, look at it uh, that way and not, uh, not kill the fun in the, in the open space. Thanks. I guess the only comment I would make to that is there are is areas that are dedicated open space and there are areas that are dedicated as a park space. And I think that that's a difference. Stafford Lake is a park area. The area up above, I look out across my street up that hill is dedicated open space. So I think, I think that's where the difference lies. Uh, if there's nothing else on this item, we'll move to item number nine. This is uh, commissioner's items of interest or request for future agenda items. I have one thing just to uh, make the commission aware of, uh, and I actually said this at the end of the last uh, board meeting. Um, on uh, February 28th, the state of California state of emergency as declared by the governor's office will be expiring. What that means is the ability for groups like this to meet remotely will also be ex uh, expiring and we will be going back to in per fully in-person meetings. So essentially beginning in March, we will be back to in-person meetings for both the board and the commission. Uh, so that's certainly something to, to keep in mind. We have a little bit of time here uh, before that happens, but uh, it'll change the dynamic of uh, being able to uh, walk away from your dinner table and into your wherever your computer is and jump it on the meeting really quick and easy. So uh, unfortunately, as a government agency, we're bound by these things, and so it'll be a uh, it'll be public meetings. Uh, not public, I'm sorry, they're always public, but in live in in person meetings. Uh, and we won't. Uh, we just you know we certainly don't have the uh, even hybrids are allowed. Uh, you know, there's a couple of exceptions that have been marked into here, but we'll be back to in-person meetings. Anything else from the commissioners? Um, I would then ask any public comment on this item. Yeah, one second. Yes, so thank you. Um, I, my public comments at the beginning of the meeting w was uh, to ask the question, what is open space? And I think that's a great subject for a future uh, meeting. Um, you know, uh, each one of us has a different idea of uh, the parks and the open space. And I do think... Um, it's good to revisit this question. Are we, are we really reaching the public like we could? We do really great for camp age kids, but I don't think we do nearly as well for other segments of our population, our user groups. Uh, Eric mentioned that uh, it's a madhouse in the summer um, and, you know, that's a good thing. That means everybody's doing a good job. So congratulations, staff. But it also means that, you know, we have an obligation to make sure that we have safe facilities, um, that we have adequate bathrooms uh, for our guests, and um, also that we need to uh, watch our expenses. So I guess it's a matter of um, just taking a look at that idea of open space. Should we be more recreational uh, oriented uh, in our open space? I say yes. 
Um, but I, some other people think that, no, if people are hiking, that's all they need to do in open space. And uh, so I think that's a subject that, that uh, the board needs to hash out. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, uh, we won't meet again until it looks like January 24th. That would be uh, 2023, I guess. Um, nothing else, then I'd uh, ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. I, can. I think that was from Commissioner Fine and uh, second from Commissioner Manish. Uh, all in favor? Thank you, gentlemen, and good night. I hope everybody has Happy a nice holiday, please. Uh, we're around if you need to get in touch with us, uh, but enjoy the Thanksgiving and and, uh, and all the following holiday season. Thank so you. Everyone. You too. Good night. Bye-bye.